good. I think we got more room. Yeah. I don't think you're blocking.
We gave a special welcome to each of you as we celebrate together the life of Andy Daikon. At this time, uh, Jerry Durant will uh, read in liturgy. Friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, hear this from the word of God. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says, None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies. To himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. And we hear this great promise from the Gospel of John when he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And from the Old Testament, these familiar words from the book of Job. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you sing with me please? You'll find the words on the back of the program. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. Is so important on days like this. And so we come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you know our sorrow. 
We give thanks that death has been overcome by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it fills us with hope. And so today we give thanks for the life of Andy Dykema. You created his body and soul, and you gave him special gifts that made him a special person. And so we give thanks for his life. Today, we pray for the entire Dykema family, and, special, and especially his wife, Carol. And we pray for all of the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and for all his friends that are gathered here today. And we're praying that the Lord would send the Comforter, the Spirit of God, who's able to heal our sorrows and lift our burdens. And we pray all of this in the name of of Jesus. Amen. Now, according to the program, we hear some memories uh, by the family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jane Dykema. I am Andy and Carol's fifth child, and I'm daddy's baby girl. The six of us were so fortunate to call him dad, and our children and our grandchildren were so fortunate to call him grandpa. But what an honor to our family, and what a tribute to my dad, that so many of you here also considered him to be like a dad, or like a grandpa, or like a mentor. Um, I've heard that so many times over the years, and I'm sure I'm gonna hear it a lot in the next coming weeks and years, and that's just quite a tribute. Another thing I heard so many times over the course of my career, and I'm sure I'll hear again over and over, is that my dad was a man of his word, and, and he was, and, and how great is that? How many people can, can say that? He shared with us his Christian faith, his wise advice, and his honest opinions. We didn't always follow that advice, but he didn't tend to rub our noses in it when we didn't and when he was right and we were wrong. Sometimes, but not always. <laughs> our dad was very generous with his time and his talents. He took care of his family and he took care of his employees. He taught us to always be loyal. He was a very loyal man. He had the same insurance company forever. He had the same bank. He had the same attorneys and the same CPA. And he taught us to be loyal. Don't look for the best deal. Be loyal and they'll be loyal to you. And they were. But most of all, he was loyal and he took care of my mom. And because he took care of her so well, she took care of us so well. And if you don't know her very well, she's the reason that he was the rock of our family. And it was such a such an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to, especially over the last few years, to watch her take care of her husband and to watch my brother take care of his dad. Um, it was absolutely priceless. Not a day in a nursing home, not a day suffering in a hospital, no pain, no suffering. He went out just exactly as he would have planned it if he could have planned it. The last morning of his life, this past Tuesday, I was with him from 8 to 9.30. He was perfectly his old self, just perfectly the same. And um, we had breakfast and coffee, and he was laughing and talking. Everything was great. 9.30 I left, and at 10 o'clock it wasn't so great anymore when I came back. And at noon it wasn't so great. But then we were able to gather the family. Everybody had time with him. And you just couldn't for an, ask for a, a better, better ending. Um, so I'm very really grateful for that, and I want you to be grateful for that. He just couldn't have planned it any better. My dad, or our dad, was the kind of guy that really made you think. <laughs> he really made you work, and he made you want to earn his respect. Um, I know a lot of you have seen that look that you just don't want to see. Like if, he, if you disappointed him, you knew it, <laughs> and you just didn't want to see that look. 
Um, he would say, don't bring me the problems. He wanted you to bring him the solutions. And he saved a lot of his time because of that, a lot of his energy. He also said, you learn a lot more from listening than you do from talking. And I'm still kind of working on that one, Dad. But <laughs> it, is a, it is a good one, but it's a hard one. He worked really super hard Monday through Saturday. I mean, he, he never retired. He still, he worked forever. He, his biggest joy was, not his biggest joy, but he really continued to want to go to the office. That was the most frustrating for him as far as his, his limited mobility toward the end is he couldn't go to Florida and he couldn't go to the office as easily. But Jeff seemed to solve pretty much every one of those problems. Uh, Sunday was his day of rest. Sunday, he was here every Sunday throughout my entire life, right here in this building that he was so incredibly proud of. And he was such an instrumental piece of a, fun, a founding member of this church, and he was just very proud of this, um, this place. On Sunday morning, um, he would rattle his knuckles down the hallway, and it was time to get up. And we would get up, and he would make us breakfast every Sunday morning, and off to church we would go. And, uh, again in the evening, and we were, back then, I mean, we couldn't go out of our yard. We couldn't ride our bikes, and when we were at the cottage, we could not ride the boat. We couldn't go to movies, we couldn't golf. Sunday was very special. Saturday mornings, it was kind of funny, like, if you, if us kids heard Dad's car come in the driveway and we were still in our pajamas, we would, like, trip over it. We were running to the bedroom to get ready, because if he came home and saw us in our pajamas, we were in trouble. And he would say, you need a job to do, I'll give you a job to do. <laughs> and he found us jobs, didn't he? Definitely. And as far as discipline, it was kind of fun. He, you know, like I said, he would just really kind of have to look at us and we would know. But with the boys, remember how we would say, I'm going to whop you one. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't, but he would always say that. And with me, it was always, you're never too old to spank, young lady. And uh, so he made sure I didn't forget that. With Judy, she was the perfect first child, so I don't think he ever <laughs> John and Jim were always fighting and wrestling, and Mom would say, stop it, stop it, and then wait till your dad gets home. But I never really remember anything happening when Dad came home, you know? I, I, just, I don't know. Um, so it was, uh, it was funny. If we cried, he'd say, stop your crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. And uh, he never did that either. But so, so today, I know that he would want you to just keep your chin up. That's what he would say, too. Lift your chin up today. Rejoice with him. He is just exactly where he wanted to be and where he's planned to be and where he earned to be. He earned his crown. And like anything we earned, he always wanted us to earn it the old-fashioned way. He was, uh, he was very much an old-fashioned kind of guy. So continue to make him proud of you, and as if he's still right next to you, because he is. I will feel that he's still right next to me, whether he's here or whether he's in heaven. Commit your life to Christ. As, like he would want each of you to do, as he did, and you will see him again someday. You know that. He was ready for this day, and so I think that's why I'm ready for this day. Um, and so thank you so much for being here, for being in this church. Thank you, Reverend Vandervelde, that he could be here with us. It's, he's been with us through thick and thin. And um, it's just such an honor to have him here to celebrate with us and to do this service. Thank you again. This one probably isn't going to go as good as that one did. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew N. Dykema. The N was for no middle name. After 91 very successful years, I don't think that middle name thing stopped him from doing a lot of really good things for a lot of people. I'm going to back up and start with, this is the retirement party send-off he would never let us throw for him. <laughs> Our father, 
my mom's husband. <laughs> For three weeks shy of 69 years, did a lot of really great things. The easy ones to list are the 48 subdivisions and the 4,323 single family home sites that he helped develop around West Michigan. With over 75% of those in and around Plainfield Township. Or the 10 million tons of material that he helped remove from Boulder Creek. Yes, our father was a very successful man, and those are very big numbers. But it's a family. We are proudest of all the little things that he did that can't be counted or weighed. Our father worked hard and was a very good judge of character. He was able to surround himself with, very, with other very hard workers. He had plenty of employees with over 40 years working together. Not saying that all things went well all the time. Yes, he could get mad. But he always let it go, and he started every day with a smile. Getting back to the little things that he did that touched so many. Over the past few days, we've been blessed to hear about so many things our father did that made a difference in so many lives. Thank you all for sharing. In closing, I want you all to know that our father is in a much better place, and now, we all can look forward to meeting up with him again. Thank you, Dad. Let's sing Blessed Assurance together. Reading from Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who does not spare 
his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who is he who he condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in the, all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a psychologist once told me, close your eyes once in a while and reflect on people who blessed you in your lifetime and take time out to express your thanks. And so today, I want to make clear, I want to express my thanks, especially to Andy for all of his assistance and kindness through the years that I've known him. And I think I've known him about 53 years. So we give thanks today for Andy Dykema, for his witness and his service to Oakview Church and to many community needs in this area. I've always, always been told, you know, you have to have a mentor. Well, sometimes Andy was my mentor. And out of that relationship comes a model. Well, I made the model. Work hard, play hard, and live close to the Lord. I think that sums up Andy's life. And so today, we give thanks for the life of Andy Dykema and what he's meant to each of us and to this church. And we want to look at Romans chapter 8. As far as I'm concerned, the greatest, one of the greatest chapters in the whole Bible. It is a favorite of all Christians. It begins with praise, and it ends with the assurance of no separation. And what that really means is that when the believer dies, the relationship with his God and with his Savior continues on and makes it possible for heaven. And in these storm-swept lives of ours, there's, there's many factors that could bring separation. The Apostle Paul knew all about those problems that come in our lives. The Apostle Paul went through so many struggles. He had health problems. He ended up in prison for preaching the gospel. And he had all kinds of troubles. But he kept trusting in the Lord. And I think it is true this, the last few years, Andy knew suffering. 
And it's true that life can become perplexing to all of us. But I think the testing of faith causes us to cry out, why? I hear the question all the time. You know, why am I picked to go through all this suffering? Why me? We ask the question, why the testing? We aren't the first to ask the question about suffering. It's been asked all through the ages. The prophet asked it. Job asked it. And you say, if you read the book of Job, you can understand why he would ask. Why me? Why all these problems? The prophets, I say, asked it. And from the corridors of the hospitals today, there are those crying and asking, why me? Why do I have to go through all of this suffering? Yes, the prophets asked him. The corridors, in the hospitals, the cry comes. And even at the graves goes up a cry. Why? The suffering. Well, the first answer to this question about suffering. The New Testament says we don't see it all. We, we only know in part. We see through a glass darkly. The, the secret things belong to God. The secret things belong to God. And there's many events in our lives. We don't have the answers. And we don't need the answers because we know we have a God who loves us, who cares for us, and will not leave us. Here we know in part and see through a glass darkly. The secret things belong to God. And the second answer to this question, why the suffering? As I read the scripture, I believe suffering can bring us closer to God. It should. But often, in the midst of it all, we don't understand it, and we get carried away, and we may blame God, or we may have many, many other difficulties. And sometimes we doubt God. We doubt that he's for us. And when that happens, what you've got to do is to go to the cross and see the Son of God dying on a cross for sinners like you and I. Yes, God spared not his only Son, but sent him to the cross of Calvary. Let's always remember that God gave his only Son for sinners. For you and I. And when we were weak and when we were lost, he gave his only son. And I like how the Apostle Paul puts it. He says, God knows and he does care about you. Let me say that one again. God knows about all your suffering and your sorrows. And he does care about everyone. God cares for you. Yes, uh, in the book of Romans, which very likely Paul may have written, he talks about the Roman Christians were going through a lot of suffering, especially the Christians. They were mocked, they were beaten up, and they went through difficult times, these early Christians. And yet, they kept believing. They kept believing because they found their only hope in Jesus. Their only hope in Jesus. And as the Apostle Paul pointed out, that Jesus was their only hope. Not only did Jesus come to this world, to reach out 
to lost people. Jesus came to this world to die on a cross to bring the hope of eternal life and the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. God has announced he's for us. Let me say that one again. God announces he's for us. And that's why he came. He died that we could have life. The Bible has what we call the comforting negatives. No more sorrow. No more crying. God shall wipe away all the tears. Today, we mourn together. But we have hope. And to remember our departed loved ones is good. And so we honor today the memory of Andy Dykema. We rejoice in his Christian witness. Yet we have to say that our works are imperfect. There's no hope in our salvation because of works. It's all of grace through Jesus Christ. But when we experience the grace of Jesus Christ, we ought to get some works in to glorify his name and to honor his gift of sins forgiven. Yes, God shall wipe away all tears. And so today, we mourn together, but we have hope. And to remember our departed loved ones is good. We do honor the memory of Andy Dykema. We rejoice in his Christian witness. God is our comfort today, and he's our, our hope of heaven. This passage of Romans 8 is the most optimistic passage you'll find in Scripture. An optimist is one who looks on the bright side of life. Now, I know Andy may have had his days, but he always looked on the bright side of life. And I think he was a great blessing in that way because he shared it with others, no matter what the problem. Our hope is in Jesus. God is our comfort today, and the hope of heaven is what he gives to each and every believer. And I do believe that every believer should be an optimist. And the reason is found in Romans chapter 8, which says there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ when we trust him. And so there will be no separation. There's a connection between the resurrection of Jesus and our coming resurrection. Jesus said, I live, you shall live. The resurrection of the body from the grave, that's not speculation. That's truth. And we claim that promise today for all true believers who've trusted in Jesus. We know we'll see again. Because when Jesus comes, it says, first of all, he'll raise those who trusted in him. And all those who yet are, are alive will meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yes, Jesus is our only hope. And I know it's all a grace. But I make clear again, what Jesus did on the cross was for sinners. 
When we were weak, when we were hopelessly lost, Jesus went to the cross and he did for us what we could not do. He paid for our sins at the cross. So the final answer to all the questions and all the mysteries is found in Jesus' life and death at the cross. God's position is announced. He went to the cross to save sinners. Well, what about you? Have you taken your position? Are you for God? Are you for his kingdom? And the hymn writer puts it so clearly when he says, who is on the Lord's side? I know as you read the Bible, many did not accept Jesus. But I like how the apostle Paul states it in Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Jesus and the power that raised him from the dead. I want his hope. Yes, Jesus not only died, he went back to heaven. And what's he doing? Well, one thing we know, he says, he's preparing a place for each one who is trusted in him as their Lord and Savior. He's preparing a place for us. And he also tells us that he's praying for us. The Bible says he intercedes for his people. But I say the most thrilling thing is the coming again of Jesus Christ. Well, let me just close with a little story of Billy Graham and a friend. Now, I've said it before, but it's still mighty true. Billy Graham received an opportunity to talk to a young man. And he came to Billy and he said, is heaven real? And Billy Graham made very clear that heaven was real. In fact, he said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. No mind can conceive what God's prepared for those who love him. Heaven isn't going to be boring. The Bible says it's a place of unspeakable joy and a place of action. And so all of us might always be ready for God's call to move out of this world. And we're ready when we know Jesus died for us at the cross. We're ready when we know that Jesus arose from the grave for us. And we're ready when we know Jesus is coming again. This is not speculation, it's certainty. We shall rise. And I make it clear, we have not lost Andy. He is in God's heaven, a child of the King. Amen. Let's just pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for the hope that you give to believers that you love us, that you died on the cross for us, that you're able to take us to heaven when we die, and that you're coming back for us and raising up the dead. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus. We'll be singing uh, because he lives. I, I think our Camilla service will be held at the cemetery. Let's uh, sing because he lives. <laughs>